morning, West Side. Hope everybody's doing great today. Um, the Bible says, this is the day that the Lord has made. I will choose to rejoice and be glad in it. Amen? That's right. All right. We're, uh, we're glad you're here with us this morning. We welcome all of those who are uh, joining us online. We just say, hey, <laughs> good morning to y'all too. We're going to pray and then we're going to jump into uh, an awesome worship set this morning. We're here to, uh, to lift up the name of Jesus. Amen? That's what we're all about here. Father God, we thank you for this day of life. We thank you, Lord, that you are here with us this morning before... Uh, we ever even thought about getting up out of bed, Lord, you are already here. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for your presence and for your guidance over us uh, this day. We ask you to bless us, Lord. Speak to us today. Let something that is sung, something that is read, something that we hear, um, something that we hear from you, Lord, uh, calls us today to leave here being more on fire for you and more about lifting your name up and proclaiming your name uh, in our community, in our church, and in our world. Uh, we thank you for your, uh, your spirit. We thank you, Lord, that you're here with us. And we ask it all in Jesus' strong and powerful name. Let the church say, Amen. Amen. All right, well, stand with us, if you will, as we worship today. One, two, three, four, five, six. Coming after me. There's 
There's no shadow you want to light up Mountain you won't climb up Coming after me There's no wall you won't kick down Lie you won't tear down Coming after me There's no shadow you want to light up Mountain you won't climb up Coming after me Aren't you glad God pursues us this morning? Amen. The Bible says when we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And you know what? He reigns forever. Amen. Amen. All right. That's right. nothing good in me you are love you are love on display for all to see you are light you are light when the darkness closes in you are hope you are hope you have covered all my sin you are peace you are peace when my fear is crippling you are true you are true even in my wandering you are joy you are joy you're the reason that i sing you are life you are life in you death has lost its sting and oh into your arms I'm running to your arms the riches of your love will always be enough nothing compares to your embrace light of the world forever you are more you are more than my words can ever say you are Lord you are Lord, all creation will proclaim. You are here, you are here, in your presence I may hold. You are God, you are God, of all else I may go. And oh, I'm running to your arms, I'm running to your arms, the riches of your love will always be enough nothing compares to your embrace light of the world Compares to your embrace, 
Christ alone my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still, when striving cease. My comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in hell is saved. This gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save. Till on that cross, as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. For every sin on him was laid. Here in the death of Christ I live. Then bursting forth in glorious day, up from the grave he rose again. And as he stands in victory, since curse has lost its grip on me, for I am his and he is mine, bought with the precious blood of Christ. No guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home here in the power of christ i'll stand till he returns or calls me home here in the power of christ i'll stand till he returns or calls me home here in the power of christ I'll stand. Amen. You know what that tells me this morning? That no matter what's happening in my life, I don't know what burdens or what troubles you may have come in here with, but if you're standing in the power of Jesus Christ this morning, you can sing this last song with us. It is well. Right. It is well with my soul. Amen. Not because of what we've done or what we could do, but because of what He's done on our behalf. Amen.
Christ hath regarded my helpless estate and has shed his own blood for my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul, with my soul, it is well. Dear Father, we come to you today humbly seeking your presence, welcome, welcoming you here among us. Let your spirit guide us and direct us so that we'll be well with everyone's soul as they leave here today. Let there be no one not having a saving knowledge of Jesus leave this place today. Let each one bask in the peace of knowing your love and your grace and our Master, our Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray for everyone in the house of worship today, whether at West Side or wherever they are, as long as they're worshiping our Lord Jesus Christ and lift up Christ to the world because only through Him can we be saved. I bless you for that gift given us 2,000 years ago on a cross on Calvary, blood shed for our sakes that our sins might be forgiven through faith in Him. Bless our pastor today as he delivers a message. Open hearts, ears, and minds today that they might receive, that we might come to a better understanding having been here today how we may serve you Lord we ask all this in Jesus name Amen Thank you for the love we welcome
that person after the, the third or whatever. Also meant to mention to you too if, if you're watching online and you say oh I want to be part of the Hoosier one and you're unable to get here just uh, contact the office this week give us a call send us an email text text me whatever and we will add a name that you would like to put on there as well so all right well good morning well um, 
couple of little house cleaning things before I get into the message this morning. Uh, as you know, we've been going out into the neighborhoods, canvassing our neighborhoods, uh, starting a couple weeks back, and we're going to do that all the way through Easter. We've got about 1,300 homes that we want to canvas. We have door knockers that we're putting on there and trying to just engage people uh, as we see them out in the washing their car, doing all sorts of things there. So if we have Saturdays that we're doing that on, if you can't make a, a Saturday and you said, I want to help, but I can't, all the times you're doing it, Pastor John, I'm, I'm not available, that's okay. We have kind of a table set up in our, our kitchen slash music room back there, and I've got all the maps and everything, all, all the supplies there. If you'd like to come do, do that during the day, or one afternoon, uh, you're welcome to do that. Just give me a call, let me know, and we'll, we'll find the right place or neighborhood for you. Uh, you don't have to do it on the Saturday mornings that we've kind of set out. You see that in the bulletin. We'll be doing it twice in February on the 11th and the 25th. So uh, just an option there. So you know, trying to be flexible here. If, if you can't make those Saturdays, you want to come do uh, a couple of homes or a street or two, uh, you can do that. I'll be glad to partner with you and go with you and, and have some fun too. So, um, And then lastly, I was, hoping to, I was hoping to have a visual prop, but we need underwear. <laughs> <laughs> we are what? Okay, <laughs> we are <laughs> we are we are going to collect. Or we're going to collect in the month of February underwear, not used, <laughs> uh, brand new underwear for ch boys and girls from the ages of four to ten. Uh, and I'm going to have a little bin out in the foyer there. You can drop it in there. So if you go to the store and you want to pick up a pack of girls or boys underwear ages four to ten, just uh, this is going to help. Matt, help me out here. So it's with, uh, because what matters, it's actually two to eight, two to ten. Two ages, okay, two to ten, okay, thank you. Uh, because right. what matters is a nonprofit in Winnipeg County that helps foster children. Um, they provide backpacks and supplies to children entering into foster care so that they don't leave somewhere with only like a trash bag full of stuff. So yeah. they're really wonderful nonprofit. They do a lot of good work. <laughs> yeah. They're hoping to get a thousand pair, I think, at the end of the month. So we can be a part of that. So everything you bring will go towards that. So help them each reach their goal there. So, so if you're shopping around, and you see, hey, there's a pack of underwear. I can grab that. So, and uh, so we'll do that. So, all right, bring underwear and, and come out and visit. So, all right. So I mentioned this last week. Kind of, kind of teased a little bit. You know, what would it be like if you have four? preachers, four pastors preach on the same passage of scripture, you know, what would it be like? What would you get? What would, you know, what it would be like? Would it be the same? I, I bet not. I bet it's going to be vastly different. So we're going to start something this, uh, starting today for the next four weeks, uh, we're going to do a series called Love Is, and we're just going to talk about 1 Corinthians 13. We're going to go in there, break it down. We may jump out of 1 Corinthians 13 and look at some examples in, um, uh, in the other parts of the Bible and, and see, but you know, uh, I, I think it'll be neat for us to kind of sit and soak a little bit on just this one passage of Scripture and really look at it. Yeah, and see, I, I, I need I need help. Yeah, you see the fancy animation going on there? Yeah, I was like, okay, I'm trying to do something fancy. I need a, like a creative team. If you're creative and you want to help, you know, let me know because I'd, I'd love to employ you as part of our creative team here at Westside. So I was just making hearts explode. So that's what I was doing uh, Saturday afternoon. <laughs> making hearts explode. But anyway, but love, it, love is, right? So here's here's the theme. Most people are familiar with 1 Corinthians 13. You know, you probably hear it. If you've been to a wedding, chances are you've heard 1 Corinthians 13 because that's one of the passages that a lot of people quote in a wedding. It's just a beautiful passage from the Apostle Paul. But I think you and I, we need to understand that 1 Corinthians 13 is as beautiful as it is and as great as it is in a wedding, uh, that's not the original context that Paul wrote this chapter in. Uh, 1 Corinthians 13 is, is sandwiched right in the middle of chapters 12 and 14. You're like, duh, Pastor John. <laughs> 13 comes right in there. Okay, you, know, uh, you know what I'm saying. But he's, he's writing this letter to the church at Corinth. And, and in chapter 12, he's talking about spiritual gifts and working together as a church. And, and then along comes chapter 13. And really, chapter 13 is the explanation of 
of how we work together as a church and how we love one another and how we love our families. We love the Lord. We love our community, um, uh, you know, our church family, but, but it's really focused on, on loving the church family. So we're just going to dive in for the next four weeks. You're going to hear different pastors. Um, Pastor Matt will be here next Sunday preaching. Pastor Dave, the Sunday after after that and then uh, brother Lyle Ushery who's a pastor he's pastored a church in South Georgia and he will wrap it up I think Lyle you've got the hardest one because you got to come after everybody else but I, I fully trust it's gonna be all right you know er, you know you think what well everything will be said no no it won't there'll be something new and <laughs> absolutely right yeah exactly so but love 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 is love man it's defined uh, by a lot in our culture, uh, love has been redefined, <laughs> uh, I think, in a lot of different ways in our culture, especially now. Uh, somebody might tell you that uh, if you accept them for who they are, then you love them. Somebody else might say, well, if you treat me good, you give me gifts <laughs> and give me attention, that means you love me, right? Uh, another person might say, well, if you give me freedom with no boundaries and let me do what I want, that's, that's really love, right? Okay. Um, but what, what does God say about love? How would he define love? I mean, after all, God is love, right? That's what First John says, that God is love. And, and, and so what does his word say about love? And I think if God is our creator, which I believe that, and I hope that you do too, if God is our creator who knows us best, he alone knows what love really should be about and what love is. And so I think we ought to zone in and lean forward, lean in, if you will, and, and pay attention and say, okay, God, what do you say uh, about what love truly is? So, uh, and we're going to see this morning from the title, go ahead there, next one. Is, uh, I, th I believe that love is supreme. Um, I, I think we're going to see from the scripture this morning that, that Jesus taught that love is above every other command that, that God gives us in scripture. Love is the highest. And so we're going to look at that this morning. Um, you know, Supreme, I was talking with Brother Jim on Wednesday before the, the kids club started and all that, and he, we were just talking about pizza. You know, it was a pizza night for the kids, and he says, well, he said their favorite pizza is this one pizza is called the Super Supreme. I was like, he didn't know. I was like, he's giving me, he's giving me stuff for my sermon right here. All right, you know, it's the super. It's not just the supreme pizza. It's the super supreme pizza, right? You know, like, and we have all these different names that we name. You know, supreme this and supreme that, and it's just, it's interesting, isn't it? There's supreme pizzas. There's, if you go to the gas station, you have supreme gasoline, right? It's just not the the regular kind. It's the good kind, right? You know, makes your car run so much better. And uh, and then there's there's, there's the Supreme Court of the United States. We, you know, it's the highest court in the land. Uh, we have the Georgia Supreme Court in Georgia. And then there's, and then there's all the businesses, all the businesses that try to capitalize on their, their business being the best. You know, whether that's Supreme Dry Cleaning or Supreme Donuts or Supreme Plumbing or there's Superior Plumbing. I mean, anyway, but, you know, all these different uh, Supreme businesses, right? Their, their business is is the top. You come to them, you'll have everything you need, right? So, you know, there's this idea that it's supreme is the best. Well, according to God's word, and I think the passage we're going to look at this morning, Jesus has said it, and Paul repeats it here, the, the command to love is supreme in Scripture, church. And this is something that, uh, this would be a little harder for me, uh, we'll see as we get into the, the passage here in just a minute, but uh, th this is what we as God's children we should focus on over over anything else. So let's read the scripture together here. Uh, 1 Corinthians 13. 
And now I will show you the most excellent way. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels and have not love, I'm only a resounding gong or a clinging symbol. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and have all knowledge, and if I have all a faith that can move mountains but have not love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor, surrender my body to the flames, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, uh, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when perfection comes, the imperfect disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put away childish ways behind me. Now we see a poor reflection as a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, and I shall be known fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Amen. Amen. All right. Uh, I want to bring to your attention there are three points to you this morning. Uh, the notes are on the back of your outline there. You can follow along. Uh, but the uh, first thing I want to talk to you about supreme love is that supreme love must accompany practical Christian lives. Our supreme love must accompany our practical Christian lives. Paul begins this chapter 13 by discussing or just using four spiritual gifts as kind of examples and, and, and of the importance of love there. Uh, you see again, he's, and, uh, number one is tongues. The second one is prophecy. The third one is faith. And the last one is, is giving. Look, as I read it to you again there, he says, If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels and have not love, I'm only a resounding gong, a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, if I have a faith that can move mountains but have not love, I am nothing. And then lastly, he says there in verse 3, If I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames, but have not love, I gain nothing. And so remember, chapter 12, your homework this week is go back and read chapter 12, 13, and 14. All together, you'll get the big picture there. But Paul just finished talking about the spiritual gifts in, in, in the chapter before this. And um, you know there were no chapters in the Bible, right? That, that came about in the 1500s, you know, so many years later, but it just made it easier for us. So Paul didn't write chapter 1, verse 2. Yeah, yeah. Um, but so he, he uses these gifts that he just finished talking about to, to kind of use examples there. And, and you know, if you kind of look at the, the, the four gifts that he wrote down there, I kind of categorize them in four different areas. There's one is beauty, the, the gift of tongues. If you read about that, it, it talks about edification. And, and it's just, you know, the way that he describes it. If I speak of the tongues of men and of angels, you know, it's something beautiful and <coughs> excuse me. The, the second part of that, you, you see, he talks about prophecy, and you think about wisdom and knowledge and everything that we obtain and understand and learn and know. And then the third one is faith, and that, you know, it talks about our spiritual, perhaps our, our growth as Christians. And then the last one is, is giving. I think about sacrifice. You know, we, we if someone is has the gift of giving, they continually give of themselves, and they they want to bless other people, and they, you know, they're many of you in this church that have that gift of giving where you just you continually give uh, but that that involves sacrifice and, and so Paul's comparing all these different amazing gifts and he says but guess what if you don't do these things with love 
then he, two things there. He says, you, you, you are nothing, and then number two, you gain nothing. You know, and that, think about that. You know, I was looking at that as I was studying this week. It's like, okay, verse one, he says, I am nothing. If, if I don't do anything with love, that doesn't amount to anything. And then also, there's those in us, in our world, in our culture, that think, man, if I do this, if I sacrifice and I give, if I learn all this knowledge and have all this stuff, and I'll just gain all this, then I'll really be something, right? But Paul says, no. He says, you, you gain nothing. You, you may spend your whole life trying to, to, to get to a certain point, you know, and our, and our world does that. They... They're trying to obtain the highest of knowledge and all this information. But Paul says, but if you do these things without love, you gain nothing. There, there's nothing that you can add by doing these things. And I think that's so important for us to, to see that. And, and for you and I, where, where do we stand on these things today? If we look at it, are, are we so focused on our own personal discipleship that man, I gotta learn the Bible. I gotta memorize this. I gotta read, read, read. But we're kind of void of loving other people, and we're so zoned into the Word of God and, and learning more and more and more. But we really don't express love to people. It's just all about knowledge to us. Could, could that be us, or are we? Maybe checking off boxes on our Christian faith. Well, I've come to church today, so I'm good for the next two or three weeks. <laughs> you know, or I, I put my tithe in the offering plate this afternoon, so I'm good. You know, are, are we going, are we thinking, oh, I'm, I'm making great sacrifices. But yet, we're not living in a, in a sacrificial love that we're making those sacrifices because we love people and we love other people. Uh, you know, things to, to consider out, you know, for, for you and I. Um, we just had Martin Luther King uh, Jr. a couple weeks ago, the, the day we remember him. This is a quote from Martin Luther King Jr. He says, a man may be self-centered in his self-denial and self-righteous in his sacrifice, his generosity may feed his eye and his piety his pride. Without love, benevolence and martyrdom become spiritual pride. And so, and, and what he's saying there, let me rephrase that to you. If, if we do something as a Christian and we're just checking off the boxes and we're doing it void of love, then it becomes a spiritual pride that might well up in us. Oh, I've done this and I've been to church for uh, this many years and I've taught this Sunday school class and, and but church do we do we love people as we serve do we love people as we give do we love people as as we break open the word of god is does that is that what motivates us to to learn the wisdom of god so that we can impart it to other people that's that's where i want to question us today are, are we just walking through the boxes are we checking the boxes off oh i've done that is but there's a true is there a true love for the Lord, for our, our church family, for our, uh, our family, for, for our community. And so I just want to leave you with that. Secondly, supreme love outlasts the temporary things to the end. Supreme love outlasts the temporary things to the end. Uh, if you go all the way back to, to verse 8 and, eight and 9 and 10 there, I'm going to re read that to you again. And look what Paul says here. He says, Love never fails, but where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when perfection comes, the imperfect disappears. Um, Paul, again, used the, he mentions the same gifts that he did when he started the chapter, talking about the gift of tongues and prophecy and wisdom. Uh, he, he brings these things back up. He says, they're going to pass away. That stuff 
it will come to an end. I remember years ago, used to listen to um, uh, the podcast from Ravi Zacharias. Loved his ministry and. Um, we all know where what happened, but uh, he he just had the greatest stories and examples that would just click with you, right? And there was this one example he would he probably shared it two or three times in some of his, his messages. But he talked about uh, he was so excited in 1973 or 74 when he got his first encyclopedia. He said at the at the very first preface of the uh, encyclopedia that he got, he said he read this his statement. It says, "In these pages lies all the knowledge." That the entirety of man. <laughs> and it goes on to say, you know, everything in these books, and I don't know if it was Encyclopedia Britannica or whatever it was, but, uh, you know, it was the arrogance of this uh, publisher of this encyclopedia said, here's everything you need to know right here. <laughs> right? And then, how, you know, that was, what, 50 something years ago? How much of that knowledge now is obsolete or just old and maybe is updated and needs you know, refreshing. Right? Um, that, think about that. You know, and I, I looked up what what is the biggest library in the world? Anybody know? Library of Congress, right? Uh, let me let me give you a few facts about the Library of Congress here. Right? Library of Congress was founded in 1800, right before Benjamin Franklin took uh, presence there. It is the oldest federal cultural institution in the nation. The Library of Congress is the largest library with more than 173 million items. Every day, every work day in the Library of Congress, they take in 15,000 different new documents and they shelf about 10,000 of those. So some of them are rejected and whatever, but they add 10,000 new documents to the Library of Congress every single work day. Uh, they, since 1962, the Library of Congress has maintained offices abroad outside the United States in order to preserve culture and literature from other nations too. And in fact, of the 173 million pieces of, of uh, documents, almost half of those are in other languages. So, wow, okay, so English, but then there's other other languages that they collect, too. Um, <clears throat> the, it, they are the largest rare book uh, collection in North America with over 700,000 volumes of rare books, including the first book that was ever printed in the United States, a little book called the Bay Psalm Book that was printed in 1640. Uh, the Gutenberg Bible, which many of you probably remembered studying in, in history is in the Library of Congress as well. Uh, it was one of the very first printed Bibles when, when Gutenberg invented his printing press, right? Um, it was purchased in 1930 and placed in there. Uh, the library also holds not only books, but they also hold uh, art and literature and photographs and prints of things. Uh, more than 17 million uh, visual copies of pictures and, and different items like that. Um, the Library uh, of Congress also has a, a vast geography and map collection that holds more than 5.6 maps and, and diff different things. So very fascinating, right? Well, it just that is the top. I don't know if any of it, I don't even know if they even let people go in to visit. You know, I, I think wasn't it the uh, what was the movie with Nicolas Cage that made it popular? Or whatever, the yeah, National Treasure, right? He snuck in there and all that. But um, you know, such a vast library of knowledge and information. You think, wow, you know, what a great. And in fact, the uh, the British burned part of the building during the war, and they they several things were lost, but they were able to save most of the items there. But such a, a vast collection of knowledge, right? But even that, according to God's word, that knowledge will fade away. That will pass away. That's just temporary, church. But but love will last. Love will, will continue and, and go on forever there. Uh, look, at, look at verse 10. It says, when, per, when the perfection comes, when perfect love comes, the imperfect disappears. Uh, 
what's that about? What, what, everything's everything's going to be perfect? No. He, he's kind of hinting at the second coming of Christ when the perfection comes. He's talking about Jesus. When he comes back, all the, all the other stuff's going to disappear. He's, Paul is kind of poetically talking about the temporary earthly things versus the eternal things here. And he's saying, guess what? Only, only love is going to remain. Only love is going to be the one that, that sticks. And, and all the knowledge that we have, the tongues that we may speak in, the, the faith that we might have had. You know, if you think about that, you know, we talk about needing faith on earth. Do you realize that faith is something that you won't need in heaven <laughs> because you'll be seeing as, as Paul says face to face right you know there will be no lack of trust in the Lord because he'll be right there before you sitting on the throne you know but so all these things will pass away but Paul says but love remains uh, you know love is love is not something that should be temporary um, you know, I remember as a youth pastor, I've been told this when I've gone to several uh, meetings in the past, and, and, and they try to encourage us as youth pastors, hey, those students you had, maybe you as teachers can identify with us too. The, the students you've had in your past, um, they probably won't remember those amazing lessons that you taught them. <laughs> <laughs> right? Oh, man, I loved it when Miss So-and-so taught us the quadratic equation. That was just whatever, you know, <laughs> or when she taught us our spelling words or what, you know. Um, those students might not remember those individual lessons that you as a teacher may have taught them. But you know what the students will remember? How you love them, how you cared about them, the relationship that you built with them over that year's time as their teacher or a youth pastor if you were there for you know, a number of years or uh, if you're a Bible study teacher, that you're, you, I hate to tell you the same thing. It's true. If you're teaching Bible study and you've been teaching for four, five, six, ten years, the, you may ask me, hey, what did I preach about last Monday or last Sunday? <laughs> they, I don't know. I can't remember. Don't ask me what I preached about uh, a month ago. I might not be able to tell you either. So, But they do remember the care and the love and the relationship that you have with them. And, and the only way, church, you know, to, to work on that love and that relationship is is for us to love people. If, if we're doing something and we're just doing it out of a sense of duty or, well, I have to because nobody else is going to do it. I'll, I'll have to step up. And we're doing it out of a lack of love. Um, that there might be a relationship there, but it's not going to be as great as it could be and as, as it should be. And so I just want to encourage you, whether, you know, whether you're a teacher, whether you're uh, working in a ministry here at Westside, or you're just doing something, uh, you know, let's make sure that we put love into everything we do, that we really genuinely care for our classes, we care for our, our community around us, we care for our, one another as, as brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, that that is so important. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I underlined this because I wanted to read it to you, make sure I didn't mess it up. As we strive to make a mark in our community with our church, let's not be misled that we can just simply hand out a food box, that we might give a backpack away, we might collect some underwear. <laughs> uh, but and give sacrificially in a lot of different ways what we must do as a church it must be accompanied to love I mean, we we have projects throughout the year we, we give to our community we do things but if if we're doing those things out of this maybe a, a wrong mindset well I'm gonna do this because that's what will help our church grow and more people will come to our church that's the wrong mindset I mean that'd be great and we want that but we ought to be doing these things in our community for our community because we care about them we love them. Um, and, you know, I don't know about you, but I, I, we can spot the fakes sometimes, can't we? When people <laughs> are putting on the good mask and we, we can sometimes see that their heart's not in it or something. And I think our community 
would be able to say that too. You know what? You guys do some things in the, in the community and you really care about us. You, you like to talk to us and have conversations with us. You're not just here to take a food box and go. You know, and, and so I just want to encourage you as, as we strive to, to kind of reach out in our community and, and to help our community, challenge each and every one of us. Are we doing it because we truly love and have a, a burden and a passion to help our community? Or are we doing it because we think it's like a you scratch my back, I'll scratch your back, alternative, you know, ulterior motive type thing. Well, if I give you food box, then maybe you might come to my church. And you know, no, let's do we really truly care about our community and our, and our neighborhood? So, and, and again, I mentioned this last week. You know, if if you're here this morning, it's like okay, guilty. I hear you, and, and you say I'm struggling with that right now, Pastor John. How, how do I learn to love my community that I'm struggling to love right now? Uh, I think first thing you and I could do is, is to pray and pray for ourselves. Say, Lord, give me a burden for my community. Give me a burden for the people around me that might be different than I look like and, and help me to, to get to know them, to build a relationship with them. And that's, that's the key is you build a relationship with someone. You learn to care for them. I was sitting with a gentleman earlier this week and what he said clicked with me. I was like, oh, there's add that to my sermon this morning. You know, I asked him, how do you reach out to a, a certain people group that I have no knowledge about myself? And what he said was so true. He's like, you have to be willing to build a relationship with them and learn and ask questions and don't, you know, and just be able to, to sit and soak and spend time. And I was like, that's good stuff. And that's, that's so true for all of us, whether it's a, a certain people group, a nation of people, or our just community is, in general. If, if we really, truly want to develop a love and help our community, uh, it's going to take not being willing to come to church, do our thing, sing, preach, sit down, pray, and then go home and, and go about our lives. We, we've got to be willing to kind of sit and and just kind of work on relationship. I know that's, well, that sounds silly, work on relationship, <laughs> but we, we have to be willing to put the time in. And I think for an American church, that is, that is so hard for us sometimes. We're so schedule-based, right? We're so, I got to do this, and I'm going to do my shopping after church. I'm going to do, the, you know, and it's just boom, boom, boom. We're always going, going, going. But we, we have to intentionally, purposely set time to build relationship with people because if we don't, it's not going to happen like it, as fast as it could. So I just want to challenge you and myself uh, this this week, church. If if we're struggling to love our community, maybe it's because we don't have a very good relationship with our community, and, and that, that's God's trying to say, let's get out there. And, and so here, you know, again, as we pass out these door knockers, as we try to make some inroads into our community, this is just an opportunity for us to have a conversation with one person or two. Hey, what's going on in your life? You know, how can I pray for you and just really get to care for them? So just just a thought there. All right, last point I want to bring to you this morning is that superior love is the greatest command from Jesus. Superior love is, is the greatest command from Jesus. The, the very last verse here in chapter 13, Paul, he sums it up. He says, but the greatest of these is love. He says, you know, these three remain, right? Faith, hope, and love. He says, but the greatest of these is love. Uh, this is this is where for me I had to do some praying this week. This this is a little hard for me, and I'll just tell you, um, you know, I grew up in this church, right? And I grew up with some great biblical knowledge, but um, sometimes I think, uh, you know, I learned who God was, who we are as people, but sometimes I felt that uh, man, the holiness of God was emphasized over anything else and God is holy don't hear me don't hear me wrong why are you saying God's not holy no he, God is a holy God but he's also a God of love too he, he is a God of love he's a righteous and just God but he's also a kind and loving and compassionate God he's all these things um and, and for me, growing up, I, I'll be honest with you, I grew up in a little bit with a legalistic attitude. Well, God loves you when you obey Him and do Him. 
And that was kind of the mantra. And, and those people out there that are not following and obeying God, then, you know, and, and here have I, Mr. Whatever, super teenager, to try to correct you and tell you what God's Word says. And, you know, and I had to, I was very judgmental when I was younger. And probably because I grew up in a church environment, right? Did not know what, you know, what it was like to, to not be outside of a church environment. And, and so that's something I've had to struggle with. And, and hopefully I've gotten better and changed it. And, and, and so here was the struggle for me, you know. So when I came to this idea of loving people, I always looked at it like a timeline. Like it was some continuum. Like over here on this side was just love people, just love them. And over here was the truth. Uh, you just got to tell people the truth and they'll change. And I looked at it like this. It was this continuum thing. And I would probably, if, you, if I would put myself a little more on the truth side right there, you know, if people really love God, then they'll obey his truth. You know, that was where kind of I focused. But you know what? I was wrong. That's that's not what the Bible describes it as. The, you know, the the Bible says it's both. We we love God and we love His truth, right? Um, Ephesians four fifteen, right? It says He says that we're supposed to uh, share the truth in love. It's it's mixed together. It's combined. They they should not be separated. You you should not have. Love here and truth way over here they should be brought together but the best way that you and I can love people is to tell them the truth and to share the truth with them but we do it in a loving way we can't run over people don't get on Facebook and, and talk about everything that I mean I, I've stopped that I used to do that years and years and years ago and I'm like you know what this is solving nothing and it's only making people mad so I'm just gonna unless the Lord really prompts me to put something on social media I'm not gonna do it you know it doesn't work. And, and so the Lord is, is working on me in that way. And so I hope that maybe maybe you can identify, you're kind of like me, yeah, man, our world is crazy, you know, da -da -da -da, yeah, and you get a little righteous anger perhaps that builds up. I, I want to encourage you, bring it back together with the love and put that truth that you love and put it with the same amount of love for people as you share that with people in our community in our culture today. That, that's so important. So um, all in Scripture here, I just want to give you some verses to look at. We're not going to read all of them right now. But all in Scripture, especially in the New Testament, Jesus commands us to love people over all else. You know, if you go to the, go ahead and put the, the this pictures up here. In Matthew 23, right, we call this the, uh, we have the Great Commission, and then we have the Great Commandment in Matthew 23, right? It's to love the Lord God with all our heart, soul, mind, and then Jesus said the second one is like this, to love your neighbor as yourself. So if someone asked Jesus, what's the greatest commandment? Love God and love your neighbor. That's the greatest and second greatest commandment. Jesus, and then Mark 12 is, is the same passage there. It's just in, in the different gospel. John chapter 13, when Jesus is washing the disciples' feet, right? He, he washes their feet. He, I love what the chapter says. It, he showed them the full extent of his love right there. And right there at the end of chapter 13, verse 34 and 35, he says, A new command I give you, love one another. And he goes on. You can read that later today if you'd like. But so again, Jesus saying love is supreme. Uh, John John 15. You can go there too. The I am the vine, you are the branches. He again says to to love love your neighbor. He says my command is this: to love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this than he lay down his life for his friends. And then finally, you've heard John 3.16, but do you know 1 John 3.16? That's just a great verse also. 1 John 3.16 says this, that this is how we know what love is, that Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. Um, another great passage. All throughout the Gospels, all throughout the New Testament, the, the supreme command that God gives you and I is to love people. 
And again, I fully witnessing, sometimes I struggle with that, especially people that seem to not want to care about the Lord and the things that I care about, right? That's hard for me to love them. But that's that's what Jesus said to do. And so church, as, as we move forward, as we continue to minister into our community, as we love one another uh, here inside the walls, uh, is, is love the very first and, and most important thing that, that we should do? Yes, God is holy. God is a just God and he is. But as far as the commands go, what God wants and calls for you and I, he calls us to love people and to care for them and to, to do for them. Um, you know, the thing that really teaches me the most, and this is, I'll end on this, is is when I look at myself. <laughs> you know, it's real easy for me to point the finger, right? We all do this. Oh, look at that person. They're doing that. They're, you know. But then I have to go to myself, and then I have to say, you know what? I don't always do it right either, do I? I, I mess it up. I really mess it up. <laughs> But God still loves me. You know, I love Romans 5. It says, But God demonstrated his love for us in this, that while we were yet sinners, while we were still messing it up, while we didn't love him, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's, that's the ultimate example of love right there. And so I just want to challenge you to leave you with a couple of questions this morning. Are you here this morning? Are you ready to accept God's gift of love for your life? Do you have a in the church? Are you playing games? You're putting on a good face? Nothing in your heart? Maybe you know a bunch of facts in your head about God and scriptures, who Jesus is, but you've never accepted his love in your own personal life. I want to give you the opportunity. You can do that. Day. You can you can stop fighting and stop pushing away his love for you. And you can say, today's the day I want to accept your love, God. And I believe that you love me enough that you died on the cross and gave your life for me. You paid for my sins on the cross. If that, I just want to help you, lead you in a, a brief prayer. Um, and you can ask Christ to come in your life. It's not just the prayer, it's, it's your heart, though. Or do you mean it? You know, are, you, are you saying this prayer and God to come to help you? If that's you this morning, your heads, close your eyes. Uh, if that's you and you're ready to, to accept God's love, His gift of love, uh, say, Dear God, I know that you love me. I believe that you died on the cross. But I also believe that you rose from the dead. Dear God, I pray that you will fix my faith. Help me to repent and turn from my sin and to live for you. Come into my life. Give me eternal life. Help me to live for you the best way that I can. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, in a minute, we're going to have... Be the prayer for today, or maybe a month ago, and I want to challenge you to make that profession public. Come down here and just say, hey, I asked Christ to come in my life. Uh, we'll love you back. You know, uh, we want to help you as you as you walk with the Lord. Uh, you see a couple questions on the screen there. The love for our families, our church, our should be supreme. Church, maybe you've already made a decision to to follow Christ, and He's. need a, a recharge? Do we need to refocus and say, you know what? I know we're doing stuff for our church in the community here, but I need to, to restart the reason that I'm this is because I love our community. I love Snellville and I love Gwinnett and I want to see people come to Christ here. Uh, and I just want to challenge you with that. And then here's here's a practical thought for you for the day. What What is one thing that each and every one of us can do uh, maybe you don't figure it out right now in the next five minutes.
but maybe before you go to sleep tonight, before you go to bed, what is one thing that you and I can do for one of those groups, our, our families, our church family, our community? How can you practically show that you love them this week? Maybe it's having a conversation with somebody who's sitting at the grocery store and down on their luck and they just need somebody to talk to. That could be it. You know, pray about that and ask, hey, say that as part of your devotion or something. God, give me, give me somebody that I can love today with the love of Christ. Whether that's at my workplace, my school, the community, wherever it is. And so make that practice. Do something with it. So let's pray, and then we'll have our time of invitation. Hey, Father, Lord, I pray that, that you will be with us now. Your Holy Spirit just has freedom to, to prick our hearts and to show us what you want us to do, Lord. I, I pray for those that maybe made a decision this morning to, to trust Christ. I pray they would have the courage to come down and just tell me that they prayed to ask Christ in their life. And Lord, if there's Christians here, Lord, that need to uh, change uh, and need to uh, reaffirm their, their decision to follow you and to, to love people, I pray that they would do that as well. Lord, give us something that we can tangibly, practically do uh, this morning to, to love our community, to love our church, our families, and our, our friends. Uh, we love you, God. We just give you this invitation time. Amen. If you'll stand, the praise team's going to uh, sing a song, and you can either sing along, but I just want to encourage you. Uh, come down in your heart to, for someone specific that you to, to be able to show them a godly love. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, taught me to say it is well it is well with my soul it is well with my soul it is well Satan should profit, though trial should come. Let this blessed assurance control that Christ hath regarded my helpless estate and has shed his own blood for my soul it is well with my soul